Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, also I don't know whether there will be people uh, participating online uh, for whom this is morning or or evening. So we have to say good morning or good evening as well to members of the audience. Um, um, so I'm Albert Chen of the Faculty of Law, and uh, it's my honor to to chair this uh, this webinar uh, this this time. Uh, uh, which is actually the third uh, third uh, e, e seminar organized by our faculty on the uh, Hong Kong national security law since it was promulgated uh, at the beginning of this month. Um, so the third seminar on this very same venue, uh, but this time uh, we are going to investigate into a very uh, specialized uh, aspect uh, of the national security law, which has not been much discussed in our last two seminars. And um, this is uh, the aspect of the extraterritorial reach, uh, uh, extraterritorial application of the Hong Kong national security law uh, in relation to acts uh, against this law committed outside Hong Kong uh, by Hong Kong permanent residents or, or even by um, by foreigners. So this is very interesting and important topic. And I would like to in introduce the topic just by saying that uh, this is a, not a new topic. Uh, last year, um, when uh, the extradition bill uh, was being discussed, some people, including legislative councillor Michael Teen, uh, proposed that um, we should introduce a scheme whereby Hong Kong courts should, should be able to exercise extraterritorial jurisdiction over Hong Kong permanent residents who have committed serious crimes abroad, say in Taiwan. Actually, I also wrote uh, an article expressing support uh, for this idea. Um, so if Hong Kong law were amended last year to introduce extraterritorial jurisdiction over uh, people like uh, Chan Tong Gai, you know, who, who was uh, uh, accused of having committed a murder in Taiwan, then Hong Kong courts uh, would be able to try him uh, in Hong Kong itself. Uh, but as we all know, this proposal was not accepted by the government. Uh, one of the reasons put forward by the government was that well, Hong Kong is a common law jurisdiction and uh, and uh, criminal jurisdiction is exercised uh, on, a, on a territorial basis. So even if Hong Kong permanent residents commit a crime uh, abroad, uh, even if it's a serious crime, Hong Kong courts uh, have no jurisdiction to, to try the crime. Now, uh, in the national security law, we, we, we see a, an approach uh, to extraterritorial extra jurisdiction, which uh, um, is more similar to that adopted by the Chinese criminal law. Uh, Maybe um, as one of the speaker is going to uh, uh, discuss, uh, maybe there is also you know precedence for such extraterritorial jurisdiction in in common law legal systems. So uh, so today we are going to explore from a perspective of both mainland Chinese law and and international law and and Hong Kong and common law this extraterritorial application of the uh, Hong Kong national security law. And uh, we are very fortunate to, to be able to get four distinguished speakers. Uh, sitting to my right is uh, Professor and Dean Fu Ha Ling of our Faculty of Law, uh, who is uh, an expert uh, uh, in many matters, including criminal law and criminology and, and public law. And sitting on my left is my colleague, uh, Dr. Peter Chow, who also specializes in criminal law as well as legal theory or, or jurisprudence. Uh, and then we have uh, online with us uh, two uh, distinguished scholars. One is Professor Ling Bing from University of Sydney in Australia. I don't know what time it is in Australia, maybe still in the late afternoon. And uh, can I see Professor Ling here? Yes, yes, yes. 
<laughs> yes, uh, he will appear on the screen soon. And then we also have Professor Li Zhao Jie of uh, Tsinghua University Law School, who is uh, like uh, Professor Ling Ping, a, an old friend of mine too. Uh, I forgot to introduce Professor Ling Ping just now. He, he had taught uh, in City University of Hong Kong and also Chinese University of Hong Kong before he moved to Australia. Uh, some years ago, uh, and he is uh, a very distinguished scholar on, on public international law, uh, as well as uh, several areas of private law, uh, including law of contract. And then Professor Li Zhao Jie, uh, he is very well established scholar of uh, international law in China, and uh, he has had quite a lot of collaboration with uh, faculty and his, and his members over the years. So, um, so we are very glad that uh, all four speakers are now ready, and um, and uh, will is there any? I don't remember the order order of presentation. I'm the first speaker, yeah. Philip and Ning Ding, and then Li Zhao Jie. Okay, okay. So may I now invite uh, uh, Dean Fu Fu Ha Ling to be the, to to give the first uh, presentation. Thank you. So um, the purpose uh, of, of my presentation today is really to introduce the, the basic rules of extraterritorial application of the national criminal law, that is the PRC criminal code. Um, so as to inform or frame our debate and uh, discussion today, uh, on the extraterritorial application of the new national security law. Uh, under the Chinese criminal code, there are five uh, principles of um, jurisdiction. The first is the uh, territorial principle, um, which of course is easy to understand. Every sovereign, sovereign power has the authority to, pub, the, to punish any crimes that has happened within the territorial uh, boundaries. Um, the other four principles are more extraterritorial, um, but then they the, uh, has been um, uh, really excised. The applications have been highly exceptional. The, the first is the uh, the personality principle or the active uh, personality uh, principle. Um, under that principle, the domestic uh, Chinese criminal law in part or uh, in full follows uh, Chinese citizen abroad. There's very much a continental civilian law tradition, which which has been has become more uh, uh, popular in the recent decades. Um, the, 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 the second uh, extraterritorial principle is the passive personality principle, uh, which allow uh, uh, the Chinese state or any state to protect its citizen by punishing any crime committed against that citizen by a foreign national in a foreign country. So basically, it's, it's uh, geared to uh, pr protect the individual victim, citizen victim in the uh, 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 home country. Um, I will elaborate a little bit uh, uh, on that um, uh, soon. Uh, the third principle is the uh, protective principle, which uh, Professor Nimbing will discuss today. Uh, that principle uh, um, allows a nation to use its own criminal law to punish offenders to harm the core interest uh, of a nation through the extraterritorial application of the uh, criminal law rules. And finally, of course, there's the universal uh, jurisdiction, which is an instrument that uh, holds individuals accountable to the most uh, serious crimes under international law, such as terrorism. Now, the, the uh, uh, jurisdiction rules uh, are provided in Chinese criminal code uh, from Article 6 
to Article 8. Um, the territorial principle is, is very simple. The, basically, the law says the criminal law apply is applicable to all who commit crimes within the territory of the PRC. Um, but then uh, there's the important uh, uh, qualifications, uh, qualifications that when right, either the act or consequences of crime takes place within the PRC, then a crime will be deemed to have committed within the PRC territory. So that got to be, uh, uh, the nexus is, is important. I think the, it's, it's a bit tricky to, uh, um, uh, to, to define act or consequences, right? In the Chinese criminal law, uh, act is broadly defined to uh, include any preparatory act. So in that sense, uh, in Hong Kong, it's happened in, in, in the past that if a person purchase explosives in the mainland and uh, bring the, uh, the explosive to Hong Kong to commit a criminal offense, that uh, is also the, uh, the, the crime or been deemed to have uh, taken place in the um, mainland. There's the infamous case of uh, uh, big spender Zhang Ziqiang, right? He, he received capital offense by uh, sort of purchasing explosives and use them in Hong Kong. Or in another case, you could uh, purchase poison and then use the poison in Hong Kong to murder someone. Uh, so that act itself is deemed as preparatory and that that will be regarded as a full uh, crime on the Chinese criminal law. Um, consequences also defined uh, uh, broadly, right? Um, it, it could be the impact. Uh, I will um, uh, explain this uh, soon. Now, personality principle is, is a very key principle under the uh, Chinese criminal law. Uh, the law provides that the criminal law is applicable to PRC state personnel and the military personnel who commit the offenses specified in the law outside the PRC. So there's no exception, right? For if you are a state functionary or uh, you're a military personnel, the whole criminal law or follow you when you travel overseas, right? Uh, that's the revised version in the old criminal code, 1979, for example, uh, the, the, the offenses is, is, was determined not by the, the type of a Chinese citizen, but by the type of offenses, right? If you commit the, what it used to be called the counter-revolutionary offenses, then the whole criminal law will follow you when the a Chinese citizen traveled uh, outside of China. Um, those are the, uh, the exceptional uh, rules. The, the normal rules, the, law, uh, the, 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 the criminal code provides uh, the criminal law is applicable to PRC citizens. Right? The, the, the citizens other than uh, state functionaries or military uh, personnel, the other citizens who commit the, of, uh, the crimes specified in the law outside of PRC, except, right, those are the two things, the important thing, there's a minimum sentence requirement, except those crimes uh, that carries a maximum sentence of less than three years fixed term imprisonment. So uh, if a Chinese citizen travel outside uh, and committed offenses that uh, carries uh, a maximum sentence of under uh, less than three years, then the Chinese criminal law doesn't follow, does not apply. So it's a limited uh, personality principle and that, that is quite important. Um, and then the Chinese criminal law uh, offers both a protective and a passive personality principle. The law states is stated in this way, right? It says the law may be applicable to foreigners, right? It's, it's uh, 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 targeted uh, who outside of PRC territory commit crimes against the PRC state, right? That is the protective principle, right? Against the core interest of the Chinese state. 
or against its citizen, that is uh, the passive personality prison board, right? The target uh, uh, offering specific legal protection for individual uh, citizens. Right? There are two conditions, but that's quite important. Uh, first, uh, the, uh, there is a minimum sentence requirement, right? It's no less than three year fixed term imprisonment. So again, there's a the minimum sentence rule. And the second condition is, is, is the most important one on the Chinese criminal code. It is also an offense, an offense punishable according to the law of the place where it was committed. So there's a sort of a double criminality requirement, right? For a foreigner to be guilty of an offense against the Chinese citizen, against the Chinese, the core Chinese, uh, the interest of cost interest of the state, uh, the act has to be crime both under Chinese law and under the law where the act uh, uh, takes place. So that is a, a very important principle under the Chinese criminal code. So of course, the Article 38 of the, the new national security law uh, 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 goes beyond the established principles under the Chinese criminal law. Uh, as Nimbin is going to uh, discuss the matter in greater detail, the Article 36 says right, the law applies um, right, to offenses uh, committed against uh, by a person who is not a permanent resident uh, of SAR, right? So the national security law applies in its entirety against all non-permanent residents of Hong Kong. So they could be foreigners, and they could be the the, the Chinese citizens in in um, uh, um, Macau in the mainland, and the nightclub to include. Uh, 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 residents uh, in Taiwan. Uh, so how to understand uh, extra uh, territory application of the Chinese criminal law? Um, the four important in, uh, factors I think are, are important in considering the, the gradual expansion of the uh, uh, territorial reach uh, or in, in some sense overreach of the Chinese criminal law. Why well, is legal tradition? Right? Uh, Ch Ch China follows the uh, continental legal tradition. The criminal law has always followed its citizens. Uh, Chinese criminal law has always had those seemingly very broad overseas uh, extraterritorial application. So that is the legal tradition. Nothing really has changed. The Chinese law has always had a very long arm. Right? Uh, second is globalization. Um, is increasing translational crime and the, uh, the impact of those uh, uh, translational crime has felt more strongly because of the the, uh, the improvement in, uh, in media, uh, communication, transportation. So um, there, there will be cross-border crimes right, taking place uh, and uh, uh, partly um, taking place in uh, the Chinese territory. Right? Either the, the preparatory act takes place in China or the consequences happened uh, in China, and uh, because of the, the huge amount of Chinese citizens traveling overseas, they may commit some offenses overseas, and that uh, uh, would um, uh, um, have brought Chinese criminal law with them when they are traveling overseas. Um, the third factor which is important is international promotion and the cooperation. There, in the past uh, uh, few decades, there's global tendency to, to expand the reach of the criminal law of a uh, nation state. For example, the best two example is the overseas bribery. Right? Now, under the, uh, the uh, UN Convention Against Corruption, uh, the member state is, is duty bound to, to extend its uh, criminal law uh, beyond its boundary to punish uh, overseas uh, corruption. 
Another good example is the child prostitution. Right? The major states, uh, either uh, civil, civil law tradition or the common law tradition, have uh, uh, expanded the the reach of criminal law to punish uh, uh, citizens who committed uh, offenses, uh, that type of offenses uh, overseas, and are now domestic court to to um, punish them upon their return. Uh, 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 to their uh, respective countries. And the final thing I think is also important is, is a big power and overseas interest, right? Uh, China doesn't have, uh, did not have much overseas interest in the past, if you look back 30 years ago. So overseas reach uh, extraterritorial application of Chinese criminal law was not really an issue of, of a great concern, but now it becomes a different matter. Right. So there's mutual learning. The uh, the Chinese state is uh, is looking at what the U.S. has been doing. Uh, there is the tit for tat war, right? In terms of a uh, competition law, for example, and also the 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 ex expansion of the territorial uh, application of the Chinese tort law, right? In, in so so as uh, when the uh, Chinese state. The economic power grows, and the, it's quite natural, uh, in a way, that the Chinese law, not only in criminal law, but also in, in other uh, the laws in other areas, would also expand and and uh, uh, and slowly, incrementally, but quite uh, forcefully, uh, um, found their application in foreign uh, uh, jurisdictions. Uh, finally, I have to say there are legal doctrines and there are legal practices. Uh, the Chinese law has always in, uh, enabled a very broad uh, extraterritorial jurisdictions, but in practice, uh, China has really excised those uh, extraterritorial uh, um, applications. Uh, there are many examples which I'm not going to mention now, but if the overreach, uh, the, the extraterritorial application becomes excessive, uh, then it will naturally, necessarily invite blockage and the countermeasures from foreign countries where Chinese criminal law is being applied. Right? Uh, if the uh, overseas reach is deemed as excessive than mutual legal assistance and, uh, and expectation being, becomes impossible. And that is what we've been uh, saying in the past few, uh, uh, few days. The, and the foreign responses uh, um, to the new national security law. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, we should be looking at a, a, a balancing Excise. So domestically in Hong Kong, we're looking at the balancing between freedom and the security. Internationally, we'll all be looking at uh, balancing between community of nations and the protection of the core interest uh, of the uh, Chinese state. Uh, I will stop here. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Hua Ling. Um, we will have. Uh, uh, quite some time for discussion after all the four speakers have spoken. So may I now invite uh, Professor Ling Bing to, to speak? Uh, I, yes, uh, Professor Ling. Okay. All right, can you hear me? Can you see my PowerPoint? Yes, yes. Oh, thank you. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Albert. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to be here. And uh, good day, everyone. Uh, it's still winter here in Australia. Uh, I'm only two hours ahead, so uh, uh, 
it's it's uh, it's it's a great pleasure to be with my friends Hualing and James, uh, and 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 everyone else. Uh, Hualing, I think, has uh, uh, provided us with a great uh, and concise uh, picture of the general uh, legal principles and legal issues that are involved in here. I will zero in on Article 38 of the National Security Law. Uh, and we'll discuss the principle of protective jurisdiction that underlies this provision. My presentation will consist of two parts. In the first part, I will address the principle of protective jurisdiction under international law. In the second part, I will discuss the rationale of this principle, the controversies surrounding this principle, and some of the problems that I see in relation to the Article 38 of the National Security Law of Hong Kong. So if we look at Article 38 of Hong Kong's National Security Law, uh, Hualing has referred to it uh, in his presentation. I will just go through the text again. Article 38 says, I quote, this law shall apply to offenses under this law committed against the Hong Kong SAR from outside the region by a person who is not a permanent resident of the region. So on its face, this law can apply in two quite different ways. In one way, this law applies to foreigners in foreign countries. So this law can apply to, for instance, Australian nationals who are not Hong Kong residents and who may commit criminal conduct under this law in Australia. So the law will apply to foreigners in foreign countries. In the second way, and this is the situation which uh, actually has not been discussed uh, uh, very much in the media or in the literature, which is this. This law by this provision can also apply to mainland Chinese who live in mainland China. Mainland Chinese people are mostly not Hong Kong permanent residents. If they do anything that is deemed criminal under this law uh, in mainland China, they will be committing a crime outside Hong Kong. So this law can also, by this provision, uh, apply to mainland residents in mainland China. As far as the application to foreigners is concerned, the provision of Article 38 uh, embodies uh, a legal principle commonly known as the protective principle or the principle of protective jurisdiction, uh, which is uh, very well established in international law. Uh, this principle, in fact, uh, was accepted in state practice as early as in the late 19th century. Uh, the International Law Commission of the United Nations uh, in 2006, in its report to the UN General Assembly, uh, included a study of the issue of extraterritorial jurisdiction. The report contains a statement on the protective principle, and I quote, the protective principle may be understood as uh, referring to the jurisdiction that a state may exercise with regard to persons, property, or acts abroad, which constitute a threat to the fundamental national interests of a state, such as a foreign threat to the national security of a state. The American Fourth Restatement on the Law of Foreign Relations of the United States, uh, which is a major scholarly work uh, prepared by American scholars and commonly regarded uh, as, uh, as a high academic authority on international law, also confirms the protective principle in section 412. This section 
confirms the protective principle with more elaboration. Again, I quote here from section 412. International law rec recognizes a state's jurisdiction to prescribe law with regard to certain conduct outside its territory by persons not its nationals that is directed against the security of the state or against a limited class of other fundamental state interests, such as, so here we have some examples which the protective principle can cover, such as espionage, certain acts of terrorism, murder of government officials, counterfeiting of the state's seal or currency, falsification of official documents, perjury before consular officials, and conspiracy to violate immigration and customs laws. The International Court of Justice has not confirmed this principle in any of its obvious cases, but judges of the International Court have addressed this principle in a number of individual opinions. So for instance, in 2002, in the case concerning arrest warrant between Congo and Belgium, Judge Guillon, in his separate opinion, addressed the protective principle in the following terms. I quote, states primarily exercise their criminal jurisdiction on their own territory. In classical international law, they normally have jurisdiction in respect of an offense committed abroad, only if the offender or at least the victim is of their nationality, or if the crime threatens their internal or external security. So Judge Guillon here again confirms the protective principle. The principle is accepted in the legislation and the case law of many countries around the world, not only in civil law countries, but in common law countries alike. In English law, uh, the most uh, authoritative statement on the protective jurisdiction uh, is probably the opinion of the House of Lords in the 1946 case uh, of Joyce against the Director of Public Prosecution, uh, in which the House of Lords made a judgment on the basis of the British Treason Act. In that case, Lord Joel, the Chief, uh, uh, the, uh, the Lord Chancellor, had this to say about the protective principle. According to his Lordship, here and I quote, no principle of comity demands that a state should ignore the crime of treason committed against it outside its territory. On the contrary, a proper regard for its own security requires that all those who commit their crime, whether they commit it within or without the realm, should be amenable to its laws. So uh, I think it is fair to say that the principle of protective jurisdiction is well established in international law and the Hong Kong National Security Law Article 38 is based on that principle. What is the rationale of that principle? Why do states extend their jurisdiction to foreigners outside their territory? Well, the generally accepted rationale for that principle is the need to protect national security. Here the point is, when a foreigner commits an act against the security of a state, that state cannot depend on foreign states to punish that crime uh, according to foreign laws. Many of the laws on national security are uh, linked with narrowly defined national interest. To put it this way, if I'm in Hong Kong right now, if I plot uh, treason or, or, or subversion against the Hong Kong or the Chinese government, that will be a crime. But if I plot treason or subversion against Australia, it will not be a crime under Hong Kong's law. 
So Australia cannot depend on Hong Kong to punish those acts against Australia's national security. So on that basis, it is said that uh, it is necessary that a state must make its criminal law uh, applicable to acts by foreigners outside its territory. Now that is the generally accepted rationale of the protective principle. A counter argument against that rationale is that uh, as Professor Fu has already demonstrated, there are various principles in international law uh, and domestic law alike that enable the criminal law of a country to be applied extraterritorial, uh, extraterritorially. So Hualing, for instance, in his, dance, in his presentation has referred to several principles. These principles include uh, the so-called objective territoriality principle, the effects principle, active personality, passive personality, and universality. All these principles allow the criminal law of a country to apply outside its territory against criminal acts uh, that may endanger the national security of that state. Uh, so why do you need uh, an extra, uh, an additional principle of protection? Now here the answer is that these principles are limited in their scope of application. The protective principle really is to try to cover those areas which are not necessarily addressed by those existing principles. One question that relates to this rationale and that relates to the principle of protective jurisdiction, uh, a, a point which uh, Hualing has mentioned just now, uh, is in regard to the possibility of, uh, which Hualing uh, refers to as the requirement of dual uh, criminality. Uh, it can also be uh, referred to as the defense of lex loci uh, delicti. Uh, this is the idea of whether you should allow the accused or the defendant to raise the local law as a defense. The uh, exception is recognized uh, in the law and practice of some states. In 1935, uh, in the draft convention on jurisdiction in respect of crimes, uh, a draft document that was largely prepared by American jurists. Article seven of the draft convention adopted uh, this, this particular exception. So if we look at uh, article seven of this draft convention, in the first half, uh, it accepts the principle so I quote, a state has jurisdiction with respect to any crimes committed outside its territory by an alien against the security, territorial integrity or political independence of that state. And then we have the exception, provided that the act or omission which constitutes the crime was not committed in exercise of a liberty guaranteed the alien by the law of the place where it was committed. So if I make a speech here in Australia advocating Hong Kong independence, uh, under this principle, under this draft convention, the law of Hong Kong should not apply to me because when I was doing that, my act was in exercise of the freedom of expression under the law of Australia where my act was committed. As Hualing uh, also mentioned, the same principle and the same exception was actually adopted in Article 8 of the mainland PRC criminal law. Now uh, I'll address the controversies relating to this principle. This principle of protective jurisdiction allows a state to apply its criminal law extraterritorially. In the report in 2006 by the International Law Commission, the commission makes this statement, and I quote, the assertion of extraterritorial jurisdiction by a state 
is entitled to recognition by other states only to the extent that it is consistent with international law. Now, to what extent is the protective principle or its application consistent with international law? Here we have some controversies and difficulties that are well documented in the state practice and in the literature on international law. And I'll just uh, highlight some of the important uh, aspects. First of all, the scope of this principle is controversial. Uh, we have the general outline of this principle that is well established, but exactly what kind of conduct can be covered by this principle so that a state can criminalize those conduct uh, against foreigners in a foreign uh, country, uh, that is always uh, controversial. It's, uh, it's not very well defined. Secondly, uh, when you apply uh, the protective principle to foreign conduct in a foreign country, you often have difficulty in terms of obtaining international cooperation in extradition and evidence gathering. If you do not have the dual criminality requirement, uh, which Hualing and I have just mentioned, and many countries do not have that. If you do not have that, and if you are criminalized something in a foreign country, which that country, that foreign country, does not consider to be criminal, well, you won't be able to get extradition of the offender from that foreign country, because extradition obviously requires dual criminality. You probably also cannot get cooperation from that foreign government in terms of evidence gathering. So in that case, you're prosecuting that particular foreign crime uh, will be difficult. Still another controversy is if a country unreasonably exercises extraterritorial jurisdiction in a way that can be viewed as uh, unreasonable interference with the domestic affairs or the, uh, the legal order or the rights and freedom of another country, that may be treated as a breach of an international obligation on non-intervention. So in other words, if country A, like Hong Kong, applies its law in Australia in a way that is unreasonable, in a way that violates the domestic legal order of Australia that violates the rights and freedom that people in Australia generally uh, enjoy under Australian law, that kind of extension of extraterritorial jurisdiction may very well be regarded by Australia as a breach of international obligation not to intervene in Australia's domestic affairs. So the unreasonable extension of protective jurisdiction may constitute an internationally wrongful act. And finally, there's also the problem of non-beast in idiom, and that is the question of double jeopardy. If an act is treated as criminal under both, let's say, Hong Kong law and Australian law, for instance, a terrorist act, well, if the act happens in Australia, it is possible that Australian law uh, may have already punished that person. In that case, if that person uh, is now in Hong Kong, uh, should Hong Kong law punish that person for the same act twice? What human rights guarantees do you have to protect the legitimate rights of that person? Uh, that is another issue that needs to be looked at. Now I want to uh, finally talk about a few issues in regard to the national security law of Hong Kong itself. I know I'm running out of time, so I'll be quite concise on this issue. Uh, the problems regarding the Hong Kong national security law, as I see them, uh, are the following. First of all, the criminalization itself. Uh, some of the act which the Hong Kong national security law criminalizes may be treated uh, as a possible breach of international law in itself. So for instance, the criminalization of advocacy of independence of Hong Kong or independence of other parts of China, even by peaceful means, may very well be uh, interpreted as a breach of 
the international human rights law on freedom of expression. If that is the case, then Hong Kong's law itself is already a breach of international law. When it applies to Hong Kong residents, it is already a breach of international law. And when you try to apply it to foreigners, then it is all the more a breach of international law. So that relates to the criminalization under this statute itself, uh, which may be viewed as a breach of international law of human rights. The second problem about this law, and especially in terms of its extraterritorial application, is in regard to Article 29, uh, the crime of uh, the crime of collusion with foreign forces. Article 29, that collusion crime, on its face, applies to foreigners, especially foreign officials. So when you are uh, applying this law, and through extraterritorial application, you can apply Article 29, the collusion crime, uh, to foreigners, including foreign officials, that raises, uh, in my view, a significant problem. President Donald Trump, for instance, a few days ago, just signed the Hong Kong Autonomy Act into law, which on its face is a kind of sanctions uh, against Hong Kong and China. And by the language of Article 29, uh, people who uh, have uh, induced the US Congress to make this law would be guilty uh, under the crime of Article 29. In fact, President Trump would probably be guilty of an offense under Article 29 as well. Now, of course, being the President of the United States, uh, President Trump would be immune from any prosecution uh, under Hong Kong law. But once President Trump steps down from his office, uh, let's say he visits Hong Kong on China's invitation, there will be no legal uh, obstacle in applying the Hong Kong national security law against President Trump, against former President Trump. Well, you might say practically it probably is not going to happen. If President Trump is invited by China to visit Hong Kong, it's very unlikely that Hong Kong law, uh, that Hong Kong uh, a government is going to arrest him and prosecute him for that crime. That probably is the case. But what about when President Trump arrives in Hong Kong, someone reports to the Hong Kong police and asks for his arrest? What about some people uh, trying to make even a citizen's arrest uh, on President Trump uh, for violation of Article 29 of the National Security Law? That would, would no doubt be a huge embarrassment of, of China. Isn't that what this law, uh, is it really what this law is designed to achieve? Finally, there's the question of enforcement and rendition to the mainland. When a foreigner commits a crime under the national security law, how are you going to enforce it? Extradition probably is not going to work here. So the law will be enforced on that foreigner, probably when that foreigner travels to Hong Kong. Well, when, when that happens, uh, obviously uh, that particular foreigner uh, is going to be uh, prosecuted in Hong Kong under this law. What about mainlanders? As I mentioned uh, a minute ago, this law can also apply to mainland residents while they are in mainland. Suppose a mainland resident now advocates Hong Kong independence in mainland China. By Article 38, this Hong Kong national security law will apply to that mainland resident. Well, how are you going to enforce it? Are you going to arrest that person in mainland and have the mainland court punish, uh, try and punish this person according to Hong Kong law? Or are you going to surrender this person to Hong Kong? for Hong Kong court to try him under Hong Kong's national security law. Because after all, I think we are told that this law in most cases should be uh, enforced by Hong Kong police and Hong Kong courts. So what if mainland residents uh, breach this law in mainland China? Should we have rendition from mainland China uh, to Hong Kong under this law? I think all these are problems, uh, the solution to which remain unclear. Uh, I know I'm past my time. I thank you for your patience and thank you for inviting me to this seminar. Um, 
thank you very much, uh, Peggy, for a very interesting presentation. Um, uh, we will now move on to uh, Professor Li Zhao Jie of Tsinghua. And uh, let's see, uh, I cannot, let's see Professor Li on the screen, but I, I suppose uh, he is uh, also ready to make his presentation. Yeah. Oh, I can now see Professor Li. Uh, Yes, please, yeah. please go ahead. Um. Uh, good afternoon. Um, uh, hi, Albert, Hualin, and Lingbing. Uh, it's really great to see you on screen. Uh, uh, well, uh, I have, you know, uh, 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 been invited to this, you know, a uh, very uh, uh, interesting uh, workshop, you know, um, uh, for this very, you know, significant subject matter. Uh, it's my great honor. Uh, well, uh, I must first give you a caveat that I haven't uh, been speaking English you know, uh, for quite a long time. So I uh, feel that myself, I feel that I have become very much tongue tied uh, because uh, from the beginning of this year up until now, you know, uh, people uh, like me, you know, have been stuck up in Beijing. Uh, we have no, you know, uh, uh, a very active contact with you know, outside world. Uh, another difficulty is all my international books, you know, uh, uh, you know, were shipped to uh, my hometown last summer. Uh, uh, that's you know uh, uh, part of my efforts, you know, uh, to prepare my retired life. I'm gonna be retired very soon, just in a few months. Uh, so uh, 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 I, you know, prepare myself, you know, for this you know, workshop, for this, you know. Uh, 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 online you know, workshop, you know, um, just, you know, um, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, on my, you know, memories, on my, my you know, uh, my brain. Uh, so if I say something wrong, uh, well, let me know. Uh, I think Huali and Lingbing have, you know, uh, done a very good job in elaborating, you know, um, uh, the concerns, uh, you know, about this, uh, you know, uh, uh, Hong Kong national security law. I have learned quite a lot, you know, uh, from uh, both of you. Uh, I'm just want to take this, you know, a time to uh, briefly, you know, uh, 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 address, you know, uh, this, uh, you know, uh, extraterritorial, extraterritorial effect of this law from international perspective. Um, as we know that, PRC law on safeguarding national security in the Hong, in Hong, in the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, uh, which came into force at the very end of last month, has been met with a wave of international criticism. One central critical point in question is the expansive scope of the extraterritorial application of that law. As Article 38 of the law provides, this law shall apply to offenses under this law committed against the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region from outside the region by a person who is not a permanent resident of the region. So as alleged by uh, those critics, this provision in the law applies, it bans everyone and everywhere. Uh, this provision in the law applies, it bans everyone and everywhere. It's a quite scaring uh, uh, critic. Thus, a non-Hong Kong resident or a foreign national living outside Hong Kong or China, indeed, theoretically, someone who has never been to Hong Kong or China could be committing a supposed offense. So as a result, some countries have suspended their extradition agreements with Hong Kong uh, as China, as Canada and Australia have already done, the United States has even enacted sanctions or other retaliatory measures against Beijing and over the law's passage. Uh, putting aside these political controversies and measures uh, over this legislation, the Hong Kong national security law does raise a serious question concerning whether the extent and the limits of the extraterritorial application uh, as provided in Article 38 fall in conformity with uh, public international law. Well, in the eyes of public international law, the extra extraterritorial effect, uh, that is the extent, the limits 
of national legislation, such as the Hong Kong national security law, is seen as a matter of a state jurisdiction to prescribe, or we call it prescriptive jurisdiction, uh, jurisdiction for short. This type of uh, jurisdiction concerns the authority of a state to make law applicable to persons or conduct. So uh, international does recognize a state jurisdiction to prescribe law with respect to certain conduct outside its territory by persons, not its nationals, that is directed against the security of the state or against a limited class of other fundamental interests, state interests, uh, as Professor Lin Bing just you know, um, uh, noted a moment ago, such as espionage, certain acts of terrorism, murder of government officials, counterfeiting of the state's seal or currency, falsification of official documents, perjury before consular officials, and the conspiracy to violate immigration uh, uh, customs law. In other words, uh, the prescriptive jurisdiction of a state may only be extended to persons or conduct beyond that state territorial limits that have a substantial detrimental effect within its territory. And furthermore, given that state's attempt to make rules of conduct in respect of events outside its own territory may bring, into, may bring it into direct conflict with the territorial's attempt to do the same. The necessity of preserving as much as possible the sovereign rights of the other state involved requires that a state's prescriptive jurisdiction only be exercised in such a way that these rights are impaired as little as possible. This means that the prescription must be necessary to reach the national prescriptive goal and restricted to the least impairing means of reaching this goal. Otherwise, it may clash with the prohibition of non uh, the prohibition of intervention uh, in another state's internal affairs, or violate its right to territorial integrity or political independence. Uh, Professor Lin Bing just mentioned this uh, in his presentation. Well, having said this, however, international has not yet developed a comprehensive set of rules defining with precision all forms of a jurisdiction that may be exercised by states. It is for this reason that the extent and limits of the extra extraterritorial fact of a state's prescriptive jurisdiction often become a matter of controversy in practice. Uh, in this connection, Lotus case in PCIJ, the Permanent Court of International Justice of 1927, is referred to as the classic international decision addressing the exercise of extraterritorial prescriptive jurisdiction. Uh, the uh, decision, uh, uh, you know, had this very, you know, uh, 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 notable uh, passage. Uh, it says, far from laying down a general prohibition to the effect that states may not extend the application of their laws and the jurisdiction of their courts to persons, property, and acts outside their territory. International law, international law leaves them in this respect a wide measure of discretion, which is only limited in certain areas by prohibitive rules. As regards other cases, every state remains free to adopt the principles which it regards as the best and most suitable. So this classic view asserts that international allows the exercise of a national jurisdiction unless a specific prohibition on doing so is identified in international law. And the burden of establishing that an exercise of national jurisdiction violates international law rests on the state asserting the violation. A moment of thought you know, will indicate, however, this is extremely improbable that this is what the court meant to say. 
uh, Professor Lowe, uh, uh, you know, published an, a contribute an article uh, to this famous events uh, uh, international law. Uh, he gave us a very, you know, uh, a vivid example. He said, suppose, for example, that Zimbabwe were to enact a law that made it an offense to anyone, uh, made it offense for anyone of whatever nationality and wherever in the world they might be to make a complaint to a UN body alleging that any state had violated its international human rights obligations. And suppose that a British citizen on holiday in Zimbabwe was arrested and charged with breaking that law by writing to the UN Human Rights Committee from his home in Birmingham with a complaint that Iraq had violated its obligations. Could it really be supposed that the onus would be upon the UK to prove that some prohibitive rule of international law forbade such exercise of prescriptive jurisdiction by Zimbabwe? So right now, uh, state practice shows that they do not support the view that the exercise of any form of prescriptive jurisdiction beyond states' borders is permitted as long as there is no specific rule of international law prohibiting it. In more than a century, as Professor Lowe uh, has noted, uh, in more than a century of objection to exercise of extraterritorial jurisdiction from the cutting case onwards, there seemed to be not a single instance of an objecting state either seeking to prove that there existed a prohibitive rule forbidding, forbidding uh, the contested exercise of extraterritorial jurisdiction or indicating that it might consider itself to be under any legal obligation to do so. So since the time of Lotus case, many challenges have been made before international tribunals. And view has been espoused that when a state seeks to regulate matters extraterritorially, the burden is upon it to demonstrate the existence of an appropriate basis of jurisdiction. An alternative view is that the exercise of all forms of jurisdiction is a subject to an overall limitation of reasonableness. Uh, in this regard, professor, late Professor Louis Hankin advises us, under international law, the permissible jurisdiction of a state depends on the interests of that state. In view of its nature and the purpose, may reasonably have in exercising the particular jurisdiction asserted and on the need to reconcile that interest with the interests of other states in exercising jurisdiction. The nature and significant, uh, significance of the interest of a state in exercising jurisdiction depend on the relation of the transaction, occurrence, or event, and of person to be affected to the state proper, to the state proper concerns. So in conclusion, uh, I found that international does set limits upon the, exist, upon the exercise of prescriptive jurisdiction by states. If those limits are transgressed, then international uh, then it can be said that international law is a violated. So as for the HK national security law, had Article 38 followed the model of Article 8, uh, Professor uh, uh, Fu just you know, uh, 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 mentioned uh, in his presentation uh, about the Article 8 of PRC uh, criminal law called the penal code, penal code. There shouldn't have been too much concern about its, you know, uh, uh, about you know whether you know uh, uh, it you know uh, falls in conformity with uh, the, the requirements of international law because Article 8 provides that. Uh, the PRC criminal law may be applicable to any foreigner who commits a crime outside the territory of People's Republic of China against the state of the People's Republic of China or against its citizens. If for that crime, this law prescribes a minimum punishment of a fixed term imprisonment 
of not less than three years. However, this is very important. This does not apply to a crime that is not punishable according to the law of the place where it was committed. I think uh, Professor Ling Bing, you know, in his presentation, you know, uh, has already, you know, uh, uh, tell us that very, you know, a uh, uh, great significance uh, of this safeguard in Article uh, uh, Eight of the PRC uh, Criminal Law. So uh, certainly, you know, um, uh, in Article, uh, well, as as I showed by Article Eight of the PRC Criminal Law, uh, the extent and the limits uh, to which this, you know, extraterritorial uh, uh, exercise of a jurisdiction. Uh, uh, you know, was, you know have, have been uh, established. So without uh, this limits, like those, you know, in Article 8, uh, Article 38 of the Hong Kong National Security Law carries with it a potential for conflicts with other states. Individual can be punished for conduct which was not only not criminal in the place where it was committed, but even when he or he, he or she was exercising a right or enjoying a liberty uh, in the other state. So sometimes, you know, uh, people call it this, uh, speech crimes. Having said that, the present state of Hong Kong uh, national security law may not be considered you know, to have constitute a violation of international law. That's, you know, a. Uh, 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 my argument is uh, probably we should give uh, this law a uh, uh, certain uh, amount of time uh, to have uh, all these kind of concerns to uh, be clarified through the judicial pra uh, uh, practices subsequently. Uh, okay, so that's uh, uh, my, uh, uh, what I wanted to say uh, about this uh, uh, internet, uh, the extraterritorial effect of the uh, Hong Kong national security law from international perspective. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, actually, um, well, we can see for your face the doing part of the presentation. So maybe when we, when we answer questions, tell the question and answer question, you make sure that you, your face uh, uh, can be seen by your camera. Uh, well, uh, Professor, I cannot hear you very well. Oh, it's, it's okay. Uh, it's fine. It's not important. Uh, okay. So we will uh, uh, pass the uh, mic to uh, uh, Dr. Peter, Peter Chow. Uh, I think you'll be speaking from the perspective of Hong Kong law, is that right? Uh, rather international law. Well, I hear a bit less about international law. I'm not sure it has a lot to do with Hong Kong law. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Albert. And uh, I've learned a lot from uh, the uh, uh, the presentations uh, before uh, mine. Uh, so one of the uh, controversial aspects of the national security law, uh, the Hong Kong national security law, lies in the extraterritorial reach. Uh, in general, uh, the criminal law of Hong Kong abides with the territorial principle. That is to say, the criminal law of Hong Kong only applies to acts committed in Hong Kong. The new Hong Kong national security law, by contrast, uh, has a uh, uh, quite uh, um, long extraterritorial reach. The particular extent, or what can be called the length, of the extraterritorial reach of uh, the new Hong Kong national security law is worth highlighting. The new Hong Kong national security law does not simply apply to acts committed outside Hong Kong by Hong Kong residents. The extraterritorial reach of the Hong Kong national security law goes one step further than that. According to Article 38, uh, as mentioned by previous speakers, this law, that is to say the national security law, shall apply to offenses under this law committed against the Hong Kong special administrative region from outside the region by a person who is not a permanent resident of the region. In other words, a Canadian citizen, a Canadian resident, can violate the Hong Kong national security law for an act done completely in Canada. And my brief remarks will discuss the justification for this particular extent of extraterritorial reach. 
The first point I wish to observe, and uh, for this point I think I'm in uh, agreement with the uh, previous speakers, is that I do not think it is always problematic for a law or national security to have this extent of extraterritorial reach. So in other words, I do not think it is justified to object to a piece of uh, national security law just because there is such extraterritorial reach. Uh, as mentioned also by the previous speakers, in international law, it is now recognized that the territorial principle admits of uh, certain important exceptions. One of the exceptions is um, the protective principle, that is to say, the idea that a state can exercise criminal jurisdiction over offenses committed outside its territory by foreigners if it is uh, necessary to protect its vital interests. This principle applies, as noted by many, for example, Professor Cameron, uh, in the Folium Oxford Public International Law, when a state exercises criminal jurisdiction, or when a state, when this principle applies, when the state exercising a criminal jurisdiction cannot expect other states to protect the relevant interests. To use an example, it may be unrealistic to expect the United States to care a lot about China's national security and therefore, it would be unrealistic to expect the United States will have a law to criminalize acts against the national security of China committed in the US. So, as a general proposition, uh, the protective principle does provide some justification for the extraterritorial, for the extraterritorial reach uh, of um, the Hong Kong national security law. Uh, so, Professor Ling Feng uh, has uh, illustrated uh, the protective principle um, and uh, some justifications for it from the perspective of international law. And I wish to now cite some foreign law as examples of um, uh, exercise of protective jurisdiction. While uh, some jurisdictions, for example, Canada, stick largely to the territorial principle, even in relation to national security offenses. Uh, the national security law in many other foreign jurisdictions do have a similar territorial reach as the Hong Kong national security law. As a first example, under Article 11310 of the French Penal Code, for offenses that are defined as violations of the fundamental interests of the nation, French criminal law applies even if the act was committed outside France and by a foreigner. The fundamental interests of the nation as defined in the French Penal Code, includes matters like its independence, the integrity of its territory, and its security. As a second example, under Section 5 of the German Criminal Code, the German criminal law applies to some offenses endangering the democratic states under the rule of law, and some offenses against national security, even for acts committed outside Germany by non-German nationals. And in favor of the Hong Kong national security law, we should note that Article 38 does not apply to all offenses under the, um, the national security law. As observed by some, including my colleague, uh, Professor Albert Chan and Professor Simon Yang, Article 38 only applies to offenses committed against the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. And so, so suppose a foreigner commits an act outside Hong Kong that would have been an offense under the national security law, but his offense is not one against the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. So as one example, suppose that person uh, advocates the independence of Taiwan from uh, the, uh, China. So his act would have been an act against the national security law, but it does not seem to be on the face uh, an act against the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. It seems that the national security law would not apply to him, because Article 38 of the uh, National Security Law only applies to offenses uh, against the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. So one may say that Hong Kong courts are entitled to protect the interests of Hong Kong, and this connection explains why if an offense is committed against the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, it should come within the jurisdiction of Hong Kong courts. Having said the above, to say that in principle, it is okay for a law on national security to have such extent of extraterritorial reach does not mean that given the particular offenses under a Hong Kong particular national security law, it is unproblematic to, for it to have that kind of extraterritorial reach. So let me um, use an analogy uh, to explain my point. 
In Hong Kong criminal law, generally speaking, the prosecution is required to prove all issues beyond reasonable doubt. That is to say, the burden of proof stays with the prosecution rather than the defense. And it is, of course, the well-known presumption of innocence. This presumption, however, is not absolute. Sometimes, for some offenses, it is justified to shift the burden of proof to the defense if some requirements, such as rationality and proportionality, are satisfied. So it's wrong to claim that in abstract, it's always unjustified to shift the burden of proof to the defense. But to say that it is not always wrong to shift the burden of proof to the defense does not, of course, mean that it is always okay to shift the burden of proof to the defense. Whether it's justified to do so would depend on which offense we are talking about. Perhaps it might be okay to shift the burden of proof to the defense for some minor offenses, but it would not be okay to do so for offenses like rape or murder. This point, I think, is rather right and uh, well recognized. Okay. Uh, analogously, while well, I think that it is not always problematic for a piece of law or national security to have a long extraterritorial reach, we should have second thoughts about this matter in the context of the particular Hong Kong national security law, given that, as I think it's fair to say, the offenses provided by the Hong Kong national security law are quite wide. So for example, one can commit a succession offense under the Hong Kong national security law, regardless of whether he uses or encourages the use of force or unlawful means. Perhaps the wide scope of the Hong Kong national security law uh, can be justified by considerations such as deterrence, but whether it is so is not my concern here. My point here is simply that some legitimate concerns can be raised when we combine the width of the Hong Kong national security offenses with the length of its extraterritorial reach. Let me use an example to illustrate my point. And I believe this example is similar to the one used by Professor um, Ling Bing uh, in this presentation. But the point I think is quite uh, important, so it is worth uh, re-emphasizing. Suppose a Canadian citizen advocates in Canada that every territory, including Quebec and Hong Kong, should have a right to self-determination. He tells the audience, and his audience are all in Canada, that they should organize themselves and try their best to achieve that purpose by peaceful means. And he encourages Hong Kong people who are living in Canada to form a pressure group in Canada to achieve that purpose. His organization and encouragement of Quebec people to seek independence would not be an offense against Canadian law. But arguably, he would have committed an offense under Article 20 and Article 21 of the Hong Kong National Security Law through organizing in Canada and inciting people in Canada to organize the separation of Hong Kong from the PRC. And if he passes by Hong Kong in the future, say as a tourist, he can, in principle, be arrested. Uh, this uh, situation uh, can be uh, regarded to be problematic. Professor Lang and Professor Lee has addressed, uh, 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 has uh, discussed uh, this problem from the perspective of international law. Another problem that I wish to highlight concerns the issue of fair warning. It is at least arguable whether it is reasonable to expect a Canadian citizen making a speech in Canada, addressing people living in Canada, to know that well, he would be, by doing so, violating the Hong Kong national security law, such that he would risk uh, being arrested when he visits Hong Kong in the future. In this connection, uh, I want to make a reference to the national security law in Macau. So, uh, I'm not an expert on Macau law, but it seems to me that under Article 10 of the National Security Law um, uh, in Macau, the law only has extraterritorial reach for Macau residents. That is to say, if a Macau resident uh, committed uh, some acts that fall under the National Security Law abroad, he would be um, uh, caught. However, a foreigner uh, committing an act against the Macau National Security Law outside Macau, he will not be caught by uh, Article 10 of the um, National Security Law uh, in Macau. So, so, so that is to say the Hong Kong, the extraterritorial reach of the Hong Kong National Security Law actually goes further than uh, that uh, of Macau. And we may wonder whether 
this bit of extraterritorial reach uh, is necessary. So that's my that's what what I want to say about the topic. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Peter. So um, so since all the speakers have now given their presentation, we will now move on to discussion, questions, and answers. So. Uh, I, I have uh, uh, got a uh, few questions uh, which have been sent to us uh, online. Uh, before I move to those questions, um, maybe I'll just ask the, the first question myself. Uh, several speakers have referred to um, this article in the Chinese Criminal Law. Uh, I think it is Article, article 8. Six. Is it Article 8? Article, article 6. Uh, article eight, six. Um, okay, Article six uh, of the Chinese Criminal Law, um, referring to foreigners in the uh, foreigners outside uh, the PRC uh, who commit acts against the, the Chinese Criminal Law. Uh, it was referred to the Chinese state or Chinese citizens. Uh, so the, the, this is the um, this is the oh yes in, uh, I don't know whether this version is up to date but but this is Article Six in this particular version. So if such a act is committed by the foreigner uh, outside the PRC, and according to the Chinese criminal law, the um, the punishment. Uh, is uh, three years uh, in prison and more, then the Chinese criminal law applies to this foreigner. Unless the act is not criminalized by the law of the place where the act is committed. So I, I have the following question uh, as to how this proviso about uh, the act not being criminal according to the law of the place and the way it is. Suppose we are concerned with offenses like treason and subversion. They may try to overthrow the Chinese state. So suppose a foreigner uh, outside China in the United activities to, to, to try to overthrow the Chinese state, we will, we will be a kind of treason or, or subversion uh, under Chinese law. Of course, if you know, the foreigner is in another state, say in the US, I think the law in the US which criminalizes uh, any activity to, to overthrow the, the PRC state. So why do we apply this proviso? Then just look at that is any law in the US against treason and suppression, and if there is law in the US against treason and suppression, uh, then, then this proviso foreigner can uh, under the Chinese criminal be charged with treason or subversion against the Chinese state. So I think it's mainly a question of Chinese criminal law. So on Lin try first. Yes. Uh, uh, do you have any insight on this question? Sorry, Albert, I cannot hear I could oh. not hear your question very clearly. The oh. microphone should I, should I repeat it? Uh, no, no. I, I suggest that you keep a distance uh, between you and the microphone. I noticed okay. it. Okay, maybe I, I repeat. I repeat the question. Um, according to the Chinese criminal law, the provision about uh, protective jurisdiction, uh, a foreigner uh, outside uh, China uh, can commit an act against Chinese criminal law, but there is a proviso. The proviso is that if this act is not criminal according to the law of the place where the act is committed, um, then then the Chinese criminal law will not apply. This is the so-called double criminality provision. So my question is, how does this double criminality provision apply in the case of offenses against national security? So suppose a foreigner, say, suppose U.S. citizen is uh, engaged in activities to try to overthrow the PLC state. And these activities are committed in the US. 
So can this foreign citizen, this U.S. citizen, be prosecuted in China for offenses against uh, China's national security, such as treason or subversion? When we apply this double criminality rule, how do we apply uh, the rule when there is no, no law uh, in the U.S. which criminalizes treason or subversion against uh, China, but there is there are laws in the U.S. which criminalize uh, treason or subversion against the U.S. So in applying the double criminality law, when we look at whether the proviso uh, applies as regards the, the act not being uh, criminalized in the place where it is committed. Do we look at whether the place has, has, a, um, nation, has a law protecting its own national security, uh, providing for offenses like treason or subversion? Uh, obviously, it is unlikely that the, that the state concerned will have a law protecting China's national security, uh, criminalizing treason or subversion against China. So how, how does the proviso apply? Uh, do you hear my question? Yeah, got you. Yes. Yeah. Maybe either Professor Lee or Professor Ling can speak first. Well, uh, if... Well, thank you, Albert. Uh, this is a very uh, good question. I think, you know, right now, you know, the, it, we are really being faced with, you know, uh, a dilemma, you know, in terms of the uh, 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 international uh, uh, perspective about this uh, 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 scope and, you know, limits, you know, uh, the, uh, of the uh, extraterritorial uh, 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 jurisdiction. Uh, the one thing, you know, uh, is that, you know, um, uh, so-called, you know, uh, state security as a concept is a very sort of a flexible, you know, uh, and can be used to uh, legitimize uh, the extraterritorial application of all manner of unpalatable offenses, uh, and particularly uh, such as you know, speech, crime, speech crime, as I said, and vague offenses, you know, um, against uh, the state. So. Uh, here we do not have, you know, a very, you know, uh, uh, well-established international yardstick, you know, about what is, you know, uh, national security. Uh, what does it mean, you know, uh, uh, international, and you know, from international perspective. So this is a still, you know, lead to the uh, 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 discretion of a state. So this is, the, I think, you know, uh, uh, one uh, uh, um, a problem. Uh, uh, Another thing is, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, how to say that, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the sort of, you know, uh, the protective principle also carries with it a potential for conflicts with uh, other states' laws. You know, this, you gave us, you know, a, a very good example uh, about this, you know, uh, uh, a person, a foreigner, a foreign national in the United States, you know, uh, uh, committed, you know, uh, an activity that is prohibited by Chinese criminal law as treason or uh, if you know uh, 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 the uh, sort of you know uh, the, 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 the state of place where this you know uh, activities are committed uh, you know are silent you know uh, uh, you know on as a law for this kind of activities uh, to my mind you know um, you have to you know sort of you know uh, stay with that because uh, when we talk about you know, uh, a prescriptive jurisdiction, particularly per, uh, on the basis of protective principle, that you know, only show, you know, uh, 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 that only shows you know, the reach of a sovereignty from you know, uh, the asserting you know, uh, uh, state. But on the other hand, there is other principle that should also be you know, uh, considered. A uh, very important you know, principle is sovereign equality. You cannot, you know, uh, Use uh, a protective. You, you cannot prescriptive, prescriptive jurisdiction, uh, such as you know, uh, uh, a jurisdiction based on uh, a protective principle, uh, uh, to uh, uh, sort of you know, prosecute a foreigner uh, for you know what he uh, 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 you know uh, did in a foreign uh, territory uh, in a manner that violates the sort of you know. Uh, 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 this is a very, you know, noble principle of state sovereignty. So this is, I think, you know, uh, uh, probably uh, uh, a, a consideration, you know, on my mind so far. Yes, uh, thank you. Maybe uh, I'll just 
use an example to clarify my question. Uh, I think the speakers uh, have just said that, well, uh, for protective jurisdiction, they may be, uh, it may be exercised in relation to crimes like um, a murder of uh, officials, counterfeiting currencies, falsification of documents. Now, for these offenses, uh, I think there's no problem in satisfying the double criminality requirement because I'm sure there will be, you know, in the case of a foreigner, in, in uh, say, uh, US, in US who commit these crimes, uh, I mean, there is definitely laws in the US against counterfeiting of currency or falsification of documents. So there's no problem that the Chinese criminal law uh, on these offenses can also apply uh, on an extraterritorial basis. So my problem is, is with offenses against the core uh, of national security, such as treason or subversion, namely to overthrow a particular state. In the US, there will certainly be no law against overthrowing uh, another state like the PRC. So, so, so when we apply this double criminality provision, do we look at whether there is law in US against treason or subversion? And, and, and if there is such law, then the Chinese law on treason or subversion can apply to this uh, foreigner uh, outside China. So that, that, that is my question. Um, can I, can I uh, uh, make a few comments on this question, Albert? Yes, uh, please. <laughs> yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, well, it is commonplace that uh, uh, some, some crimes uh, are particularly linked and narrowly linked to the interest of a particular nation. So if I'm in China, I do treason against China, that's a crime. I do treason against Australia, that's not a crime under Chinese law. I bribe Chinese official, that's a crime. I bribe Australian official in China, that's not a crime under uh, uh, Chinese law. So you have these crimes that are particularly linked to the interest of the state which makes the criminal law. Now your question is, in article, it's actually article eight of the Chinese criminal law, there is this exception uh, in favor of local law defense. If I commit one of those crimes that's narrowly linked to the Chinese interest, such as things like secession or treason or bribery, for instance, uh, how do we apply the double, the dual criminality requirement? Actually, Albert, as you were speaking, I just got a WeChat message from one of my colleagues in, in Beijing, and he was telling me that uh, actually in China, there were very small number of cases that have applied uh, this particular Article 8. Uh, he says there were no more than six cases. Uh, so I'm pretty sure that, that Chinese courts probably have not uh, answered this question yet. And as you properly pointed out, this is a question of interpretation of Chinese law. There is no answer in international law uh, to that question. And as far as Chinese law is concerned, my guess would be that a Chinese judge would say, well, if US has treason law or bribery law, that's good enough for me. Uh, the defendant cannot benefit from that exception. Uh, the defend the, uh, our Chinese law uh, can apply to that defendant. And I would actually agree with that judge's view. Uh, even though the Chinese law on how to apply the double criminality requirement is not clear, uh, the international jurisprudence on the application of the dual criminality requirement in relation to extradition law, uh, however, is quite clear. And we here in, you know, people in China obviously have been uh, paying a lot of attention to the Meng Wanzhou case in Canada. And the recent judgment was precisely on the point of dual criminality. And I think under, if we follow uh, the extradition jurisprudence, now, obviously, treason and secession, that kind of thing usually is not covered by extradition being a uh, political offense. But uh, offenses like uh, corruption or, or, or bribery, uh, it probably would be enough 
uh, if the law of the other country has uh, provisions uh, dealing with similar conduct uh, and considering these conduct as, as criminal. Uh, it is not necessary that the foreign law uh, should criminalize a particular conduct against a particular country. So I would, so, so to, to answer your question, I would think that as long as the American, the US law has uh, criminalized treason or, 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 or subversion and, and, and so forth, uh, Chinese law would uh, apply to the crime. I'm not sure if Hualing uh, has other thoughts on that, and uh, I would certainly love to hear that. I, I think um, I th look at the past cases, uh, it's difficult to offer some guidance, right? Uh, as in the cutting case that was referred to, which is uh, was a case from uh, 1880-something. It's about criminal defamation, right? The U.S. answer for the, for, for, for the Mexican prosecution of American citizen for criminal defaming a Mexican citizen was that when the U.S. law, our defamation was defined differently. So had the act happened in the U.S., that person would not have been guilty. So even though defamation is the name of the offense, but then if you look at the substance, if they are different, then you will have difficulties to apply the uh, double criminality rules. Most of the cases, unfortunately, happen to, uh, to terrorism, which is, tend to be more universal. I, th I think that there's three levels, right? I think there's three you may say legal principles. The number one is sovereignty. I, I think uh, Zhao Jie said this very clearly, the, the sovereign has the power to make a criminal law and to extend the application of criminal law overseas in cases mm -hmm. of core national uh, interest. This is number one, all right? Number two, is the laws of the the uh, uh, let me use the term the foreign state right say Australian Can Can Canadian laws whether uh, they define treason uh, a subversion if there is such an offense in that way right then there may be uh, there are countries publish here the Chinese tradition define secession in more or less the same way right then you don't have a conflict. Um, but beyond that, there's a third principle. I think there are international norms, right? Uh, there are minimum rules in the international law all nation states would have to follow, right? In that sense, then uh, that uh, would have some overriding impact uh, on the, the the definition doctrines and the practices of uh, you know, double criminality uh, in both extradition and in uh, jurisdiction uh, matters. Um, it seems that some members of the audience said that my, this mic of mine is not working, so I'm now using the other mic. So what I'll do is maybe to read out uh, several questions, and then um, maybe you know, the speakers can, can, can consider which question they would like to answer. Maybe I'll just explain that the reason why I asked my, my earlier question was that um, Article 38 uh, of the National Security Law, which we are considering, does not have the same proviso about double criminality as uh, Article uh, 8 of the Chinese Criminal Law. And, and that, is, that is why I was wondering whether, whether this means that the national security law uh, is broader in its application uh, as far as the protective jurisdiction is concerned than uh, Article 8 of the Chinese Criminal Law. But judging from what has been said, particularly by Professor uh, Ling Bing, uh, it seems that maybe as far as so since the national security law is limited to national security offenses, maybe there's no need for um, for the general um, double criminality provision uh, in, in Article 8. Uh, 
but but this is a difficult question and uh, we can uh, consider this further in the future now maybe um i'll read a few questions um one question uh oh, well sorry this says this was shut down in two questions two 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 seconds I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. There are some technical problems. Uh, some technical problems. The, the questions have disappeared from this screen. Is there another screen with questions which I can read out? Okay, I've got another screen now. Um, so uh, um, I think there is a question about double criminality, but I think we have uh, we have explored that just now. So I'll, uh, I'll start with another question. Doctor Chow argues that Hong Kong criminal laws and jurisdiction should apply, but if but there's no local legislation, Article Twenty Three. How can Hong Kong criminal law be applied in the implementation of the Hong Kong national security law. I'm not sure I fully understand this question, but uh, I've just read it out. Uh, this is another sec second question for Professor uh, Bing Ling. I wonder if there's any similar law to Article 29 and 38 in foreign security law in US and uh, UK. Of course, foreign people can enjoy freedom of speech. Uh, sorry, I, I suppose the, the, the member of the audience is referring to the Article 29 or 38 uh, of, uh, sorry, I don't know which, which law uh, he or she is referring to. Uh, and the, the question continues, foreign people can enjoy freedom of speech outside Hong Kong, such as to support or advocate Hong Kong independence. He or she is considered to violate Hong Kong's national security law uh, if uh, he does so. So long as he doesn't come to Hong Kong, he will not be arrested or prosecuted. I suppose this seems to be a comment rather than a question. Okay, another question. As a practical matter, the extraterritorial aspect of the law affects mostly persons who happen to travel to Hong Kong as opposed as opposed to someone who would never set foot in Hong Kong or China. Is that a conclusion I can draw from the presentations today? A follow-up question is, if this is the case, how would it affect Hong Kong as an international city where people around the world would come to Hong Kong for business, arts, uh, etc.? Okay, so um, another question. How about Hong Kong residents outside Hong Kong going against the HKSAR, uh, is this an issue? I'm not sure I understand this question. Uh, okay. Um, okay, Professor Fu said the extraterritorial principle has been rarely applied by China. Professor Ling Bing said the Hong Kong national security law uh, territory territoriality may violate international law, while Professor Lee said this does not violate international law. My question is whether the extraterritoriality principle violates international law is not the issue. The major challenge is how China applies the Hong Kong national security law in the Hong Kong case, i.e. the constitutional practices are and will be more important than whether the Hong Kong national security law violates the international law. Do the three professors agree on this point? So that is one question. Um, okay, another question. While Professor Ling argued the ban on peaceful advocacy could be international law, which exact, which exact international law are we referring to? And, uh, and since of course, like such, is that justified? Um, is that justified to drop the, the extradition treaties with Hong Kong as Australia and Canada are doing? Okay, another question. How can universities of Hong Kong protect professors in their universities 
on this national security law regarding academic freedom. And, and another, uh, so there are many questions. Maybe I should read out. Otherwise, people can complain. Will complain that their questions are not given attention. Is that too many questions? Maybe have the first round. Uh, I think just give me a few more minutes to read out a few more. Uh, uh, may I ask, putting ethical judgments aside, to what extent would overseas kidnapping by government agents in foreign territory be justified under this law? Uh, so I, I'm not sure I understand this question completely. Um, offenders in the political move in nine, uh, last year and this year shouted Hong Kong independence and advocated other Hong Kong citizens to do ultimately to do so. Uh, and these people ultimately fled to other countries. The extraterritorial reach of the national security law cannot be successfully prosecuted if the counterpart government does not cooperate. So, so this is a uh, this is a, 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 a comment. So maybe uh, there are still other questions which I'll read out as a second batch. In the meantime, would any of the speakers like to respond to any of the questions or, or, or points which have just been made? The, the last question, I think the national security doesn't apply to the act happened last year, right? So they may have a fleet to other countries, but then they may be guilty of other offenses uh, of the time, but not this new law. Uh, kidnapping, of course, is, is a different matter. I think, I think the, the issue is uh, that there are two separate issues. One is uh, criminality. Right? The, the law says certain things are, are crime, regardless of where you are. Right? Whether the state uh, government uh, has the uh, power, resources, and the political will to enforce those laws over this uh, is, is one matter. Right? Um, it's, it's a different matter uh, whether foreign countries or either extradite them back to Hong Kong for, to, uh, to, to face trial, or the, uh, an individual to somehow travel to Hong Kong and face legal uncertainty. Those are different issues. So looking at the, the foreign responses, of course, uh, they, they all, they, 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 quite a few states has suspended the extradition uh, treaties with Hong Kong largely res in response to this legal uncertainty. Uh, and um, and uh, uh, I think that Article 33 is a huge challenge. Uh, I think the the one the, the person raised the question is right. Of course, I, I, Hong Kong is an international city. Uh, people travel around. Um, if people st stop doing that, then uh, that will have huge uh, political and economic impact in Hong Kong. As to the question of uh, academic freedom, uh, it, it there will be a separate issue that will, will be addressed uh, um, in, in due course. Thank you. Um, Professor Ling, uh, Annie, do you have any comments? Uh, I just, uh, uh, before I address some of the questions, uh, I think, Albert, the question that you uh, asked earlier, which I answered a little bit, actually is, is very important uh, and, and it is a fundamental question. Uh, the question about uh, applying your law to a crime that's committed in a foreign country and to take into account what foreign law says about that particular conduct, uh, it really uh, illustrates the kind of a fundamental uh, balance of interest that is involved in uh, these uh, principles on extraterritorial jurisdiction. Uh, obviously, uh, from Hong Kong's point of view, you want to protect the national security, and that's why you want to extend your law to foreign conduct. But on the other hand, uh, extension of foreign law, extension of criminal law to a foreign country may very well interfere with the legal order, the, the, the domestic affairs of, of another country. So you want to take into account what foreign law has to say uh, about the conduct. So where are you going to strike the balance? I think that's, uh, that, 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 that's really uh, what underlies the question that you put forward. But I, uh, I think I would say 
the fact that Article 38 does not include this, this exception, this double criminality requirement, is still very significant because if we look at the crimes that are set out in this national security law, there are certain crimes, so-called crimes, uh, that are clearly not crimes uh, under the law of foreign countries. For instance, uh, peaceful advocacy of separation of a part of the territory from the country. That's clearly not criminal under, for instance, Canadian law or, or English law, or obviously with Scottish independence, with Quebec uh, a referendum. Uh, clearly under the laws of these countries, it is not criminal at all to advocate independence in a peaceful way of part of the territory from the country. Uh, the other law about uh, inducing a foreign government to pass sanctions against China. I don't know if this kind of conduct would be treated as criminal uh, under the laws of major uh, Western legal systems that I'm aware of. Uh, it may be borderline treason, uh, but usually if you just go to a foreign capital and, 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 and make a case that uh, that foreign country should impose sanctions on your national state, I don't know if that's considered criminal uh, under US law or, or Canadian law or Australian law. So I think the fact that Article 38 does not have the double criminality requirement uh, is a mistake and it is significant. Uh, regarding the questions that uh, are uh, put forward by the uh, audience, I think I want to address one important legal question, which is whether countries like Canada and, and, and Australia suspending the extradition treaty, whether that's justified or not. I have actually said in Australian media that I don't think, uh, I think Australian suspension of the extradition treaty is a premature overreaction. And the reason is, that extradition treaty actually has important safeguards. Uh, the treaty does not cover any of those national security crimes. So uh, the treaty actually has nothing to do with national security crimes at all. So that's, that's, that's uh, for the start. And then the treaty excludes political offenses. The treaty does not apply to Australian nationals. So I thought uh, the Australian government was acting prematurely uh, in suspending the extradition treaty. However, I thought the, uh, the suspension, uh, which is allowed under the treaty itself, the treaty allows termination uh, of the treaty with six month notice. So it's, it's legally allowed. And it is also understandable because of Article 55 of the National Security Law, the provision regarding central jurisdiction. If let's say we have a terrorist crime, and Hong Kong requests extradition from Australia, and presumably I would think that uh, the crime will be covered by the treaty, and if Australia surrenders the terrorist suspect to Hong Kong. And let's say then uh, the National Security Office in Hong Kong steps in and says, Article 85, we want this person to be tried in Beijing. Now, under the National Security Law, on what ground can Hong Kong refuse that request? I can't see any. That person under the law has to be transferred to Beijing and that person will be prosecuted and tried and punished in China. That I think is really the, a killer for the extradition relationship between Hong Kong and Australia and probably with other countries too. When you have this, this now a new loophole which requires Hong Kong to surrender a fugitive to mainland China on grounds that are not traditionally reviewable, and in fact, in circumstances that are very ill-defined, I, I think many other countries will need to reconsider the extradition treaty with Hong Kong. Uh, thank you. Um, Professor Li, would you, do you have any comments? Uh, uh, well, you know, uh, now in China, uh, you know, we also, um, uh, did some informal discussions about, you know, the extraterritorial effects of this. We cannot see your face, Dajia. Uh, huh? Cannot see your face. What about now? Yes, that's yeah, better. Now. Yeah, yeah, that's better. Okay, uh, I said, you know, uh, 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 you know, back in China, you know, we had, you know, some informal online discussion about, you know, uh, the um, uh, uh, extraterritorial effect of this, you know, uh, Hong Kong. 
uh, national security law. And uh, I feel that, you know, uh, uh, sort of, you know, um, uh, uh, too much expensive, you know, in terms of the scope and the limits, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, to this, you know, extraterritorial application uh, is really concerned. But, you know, um, some of, you know, uh, Chinese, uh, mainland-based Chinese scholars, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, thought about this, you know, in another direction, say, oh, this is a sort of a comprehensive, you know, uh, coverage uh, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, uh, extraterritorial uh, application uh, is, is, is a good because, you know, it can, you know, uh, serve as a sort of a deterrence uh, uh, to you know those troublemakers, so uh, 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 we don't give them a chance, you know, uh, to 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 uh, 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 flee you know, uh, from this uh, uh, legal nexus. Uh, I uh, really, you know, sort of, you know, uh, saw, you know, gave you know uh, quite a considerable thought about this argument. I think it's a uh, wrong. You know, we cannot use you know uh, 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 this argument to justify uh, uh, this uh, sort of you know uh, seemingly uh, very comprehensive without. The non limits, you know, uh, 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 you know, to these, uh, you know, uh, ex territorial jurisdiction. Uh, 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 the, 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 I think you know, the, 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 the concern, you know, uh, uh, here, uh, I think Professor Fu, you know, just uh, did that, you know, a moment ago. Uh, and also, Professor Ling Bing used the balance, you know, of the uh, two concerns. One is sort of you, uh, we, when we say jurisdiction, that's a reach of sovereignty. When you have to sort of, you know, let me, uh, 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 interest, particularly the fundamental interest. We, <laughs> the, the American use fundamental, not the core, uh, to be sort of, you know, uh, uh, well protected. But on the other hand, uh, other uh, states' uh, uh, interests should also be well sort of, you know, uh, respected and also you know, uh, protected. So. Uh, 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 the, 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 the very difficult job is where this, you know, line of balance uh, uh, should be sort of drawn. Uh, that is sort of, you know, uh, uh, probably, you know, uh, uh, not very easy uh, to answer. So that's why I said, you know, uh, so far you cannot say, you know, uh, the present state of, you know, uh, Hong Kong national security law violates, you know, a sort of, you know, uh, a customary, or, you know, international. Because I, I, I do believe that, you know, uh, if, you know, we have uh, 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 more time, if we gave more time to uh, 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 this uh, Hong Kong national security law, uh, probably a lot of, you know, questions can be uh, clarified uh, in the, uh, uh, through, throughout this process of judicial practice. Uh, some one recent question, you know, uh, uh, when the people draft, you know, uh, Hong Kong national security, do they, uh, you know, take account, uh, 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 you know, into the requirements of international law? Uh, my answer is I don't know. Uh, 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 someone asked, is international that important, uh, more important than the sort of, you know, a constitutional law? Uh, I'm a scholar, you know, on, of international law, you know, I'm, I've been teaching internet. I, I, I think, you know, uh, 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 in this, uh, you know, uh, in today's world, you know, uh, you, know, uh, uh, but, you know, we're living in an era of interdependence, you know, uh, 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 good, you know, uh, inter, uh, well international, you know, uh, 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 based uh, domestic law, particularly, you know, domestic law with this territorial effect uh, uh, is a very important thing. It's a very important thing. Uh, you know, Professor Ling uh, just mentioned about uh, the reason why, you know, uh, 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 Australia, you know, uh, suspended the uh, extradition agreement. Because without this sort of, you know, uh, 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 respect to, you know, uh, international requirements, uh, you lost trust, certainty about your, you know, uh, own legal system. The people from other countries, I think they, they, they feel very reluctant to travel uh, into Hong Kong. Uh, so this is, you know, uh, 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 my answer to this question. International is also uh, equally uh, important. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Peter, do you have any comment? No. Uh, okay. So, so I will read out uh, several more questions. Um, this is probably the last round of questions since we, our seminar is originally supposed to end at 5 p.m., but we'll extend it uh, for 20 minutes uh, so as to uh, allow a second uh, batch of questions. 
So uh, I'll start with uh, there's there's one question about um, uh, I think there there was a question about um, whether these police powers can be exercised uh, outside Hong Kong uh, under under the national security law. The police. Uh, is given fairly extensive powers, but can they exercise them outside Hong Kong? That's one question. Um, uh, there's a question about extradition uh, from Hong Kong to the PRC, uh, where somebody um, has committed an offense uh, over which the central authorities exercise jurisdiction, will that be extradition uh, from Hong Kong to the, to mainland China? This is, this is another question. Uh, one question about companies. So in view of Article 38 uh, express wording re regarding foreign residents, does the national security law apply to foreign companies committing an offense outside Hong Kong? Of course. Uh, there's another, another question about companies. Set Article 29.4 of the national security law provides that it's an offense uh, if a person imposes sanctions or blockage or engage in hostile, activity, uh, hostile activities against Hong Kong SAR or PLC. If a U.S. company is required by the U.S. government under the U.S. law to impose sanctions, will it be in breach of Article 29, Paragraph 4? So, it's a, quite a good question. Um, another question about um, airport. How about transferring tran transfer flights in Hong Kong airport? Will those people uh, who have committed acts against the national security law be arrested if they are having a transfer of flights uh, in Hong Kong airport? Um, a question about human rights. Can you please comment on international human rights, international human rights norms and standards as regards when national security may appropriately be invoked to impinge on protected rights. Um, international students, what do international students have to keep in mind while coming to study full-time in Hong Kong? How does, this, how does this law apply to them and to their speech? Um, Hong Kong supposedly do not exercise press control or, relig uh, or on control of religion, peaceful demonstration, etc. But say a journal reported in a reported a potential corruption issue regarding a senior official. Uh, it seems an offense on lacking on leaking national state secrets. I think it is, uh, and it passed to overseas countries may result in sanction against the government. Uh, so press and media individuals, whether they reside in Hong Kong or not, are no longer entitled to, um, to these, these pro this right to protest, etc. Uh, so this is a question. Um, Oh, this one question about Professor Lee. Can Professor Lee expand on why he thinks that deterrence for troublemakers as a justification is wrong? Uh, so I'm not sure I heard exactly this point, but this is the question. Um, is it the case that once a case has been transferred to the courts in the mainland, Common law cases and principles would no longer be applicable. Okay, um, I think 
probably because of time limits, uh, I will. Uh, I will. This is the end of the second batch of questions. If anybody has any pressing question, you are welcome to type the question now, so that maybe I can allow uh, two or three other questions, uh, which I type in from this moment onward. So now I'll invite the four speakers to respond to the questions. Yes, they are guests too. Who? Albert, uh, 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 I voluntarily take the uh, first question. Uh, they sort of like police yes, you. power, uh, you know, extraterritoriality. Uh, uh, from international perspective, you know, uh, you were talking about the enforcement jurisdiction. Enforcement jurisdiction, as well established under international, must be you know uh, territorial. Uh, in other words, police cannot exercise its power. Uh, extra territory unless uh, uh, they uh, got the permits of the state concern. Uh, this is, uh, as I said, firmly established principle of international. Otherwise, you know, uh, 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 that's a violation of international. Uh, uh, so this is a, a, my uh, a very quick answer to uh, the first question. Thank you. Uh... Rosaline, uh, do you have any comments? Yes. Uh, let me just address a few questions here. Uh, if someone goes to Hong Kong airport for transfer to another flight, will that person be in danger of being arrested for violation of national security law in his or her own country? Uh, I don't think, I don't want to appear or sound alarmist. Uh, obviously, the answer to that question is yes, you are in danger. But <laughs> I think we have just uh, seen uh, that uh, the mainland uh, criminal law, the similar extraterritorial provision, actually has not been applied very extensively, only in a small number of cases, uh, and probably in cases involving things like terrorism and drug smuggling and that kind of thing. So. Uh, Realistically, I don't believe that the extraterritorial application of this Hong Kong law to foreigners outside Hong Kong would actually happen uh, in too many cases. Uh, I would bet that it would actually be a small number of cases probably involving serious uh, uh, circumstances. Uh, but the legal risk is there. Uh, so uh, I think there's another question about international students. Well, international students coming to Hong Kong obviously we'll need to uh, have some knowledge about Hong Kong law uh, in advance. Uh, and there's always a risk that uh, uh, the authorities may hold you uh, responsible for your uh, conduct violating those local laws. Uh, the question about companies I think is very interesting. Uh, the, uh, I think Article 38 uh, talks about uh, persons who are not permanent residents. So I think it is open to argument that Article 38 only applies to natural persons and does not apply to companies. Obviously, uh, if you are a company, uh, a company does not have a Hong Kong permanent uh, residence. So the way Article 38 is formulated I think it opens up the possibility to argue in a court of law that it is meant to apply only to natural persons. Uh, so I think the argument uh, is there. Now, whether uh, a Hong Kong court will buy that in a future uh, case, I don't know, but, but I think certainly it is arguable. If a company in the United States is required to impose sanctions or to carry out sanctions against uh, China, or Hong Kong, uh, would that company also be violating the national security law of, of Hong Kong? Uh, I think that, that's a, another a classical uh, question uh, in those cases regarding conflict of jurisdiction. Uh, it has happened in numerous cases, not relating to national security, but in other, especially commercial areas, in which one country's law requires a company or a person to do this or not to do this. Whereas the law of the other country, another country says you must do this or you must do a different thing. 
which of course uh, lands that particular person in a dilemma, in a, in a very difficult uh, situation. Uh, some countries, especially United States courts, uh, have a so-called foreign sovereign compulsion uh, doctrine, which essentially says that you are not going to apply an extraterritorial law uh, if it is against the legal obligation under the territorial law, under the local law. So in other words, territorial law, local law should prevail over the requirement of an extraterritorial law. Uh, that is one way to solving uh, this type of jurisdictional conflicts. And some countries follow that. Uh, I don't think this is part of the Hong Kong law. Uh, how would Hong Kong court deal with uh, these questions? I think still remains to be seen. I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh this Hualing or Peter? Uh, right. Um, just a quick answer to a few questions. First, I don't think the police power can be extended outside of uh, Hong Kong. So that has to go through the mutual legal assistance uh, through criminal matters. Um, complying uh, with US law, um, the, US, the sanction against Hong Kong China itself is not offense. I think the offense is to requesting and making it possible, uh, lobbying for a sanction that is this this action um, uh, is the offense. And then passively following the US law, any other law will not be an offense under, under the national security law. Um, the national jurisdiction, uh, Article 55, the two questions, one is whether there will be extradition uh, once national jurisdiction is triggered. And actually, uh, once you have Article 55 jurisdiction, there will be no boundary and there's no need for extradition. Basically, uh, um, uh, this what I will call this because it's a national jurisdiction, right? Uh, at that moment, then you don't really have this boundary uh, between mainland and Hong Kong as far as criminal jurisdiction is concerned. Uh, with the common law apply, of course not. Um, it's a national jurisdiction, uh, Chinese procedure law would apply. Uh, the Hong Kong, basically, uh, Hong Kong law on that matter. Once 55 jurisdiction is triggered, the Hong Kong law starts to uh, operate. It's the Chinese nation, national law takes it over. That's, that is why it is called national jurisdiction. Um, foreign students coming to Hong Kong, well, um, will be treated the same way as Hong Kong students in Hong Kong. Um, I, th I think I just want to uh, emphasize: we look at the the offenses, right? The offenses is um, organizing, uh, planning implementing, participating in those activities. So unless uh, foreign students are here actively participating, organizing, uh, planning those offenses, uh, like uh, treason, subversion, espionage, um, I don't think uh, coming here to study per se, right, uh, would would, would have any risk. That is the same, that's the it's exactly the same thing we've been uh, uh, telling our own students. The law does have a boundary. Right? I think uh, the purpose of the discussion is uh, through the discussion we could uh, somehow clarify the boundary, reinforcing the boundary so that we know better uh, where the line actually is. Uh, but as long as uh, we stay with, away from the four verbs, right? Uh, then I think we could say some um, uh, uh, boundary and the, the line between the criminal offenses under the law and the regular teaching and learning in the university. Thank you. Yes, Peter has one. Yeah, um, I, I want to say, uh, um, uh, well, as the first is actually a question to Hua Ling. 
about, um, let's say, American company here. Let's say he uh, helped to impose sanctions under the instructions of uh, the United States. So uh, have I understood you correctly? Huaning, you said that that would be a crime under the national security law? No. But uh, however, under Article 29, it says that uh, a person who receives instructions from a foreign country uh, to commit any of the following acts, including the imposition of sanctions, shall be guilty of an offense. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure because this law has not been applied yet. So I'm really not sure how it would be implemented in practice. But there would be a case for saying that that falls under the provision that I, I've just quoted. And uh, you may say that, well, you have no other choice. You're under legal duty because you're a US company. But uh, in, I, I'm not sure in general, uh, in, under at least the uh, Hong Kong and English criminal law, superior order is no uh, uh, de defense. So yeah, I, I would not be so certain that uh, that company would not be liable under Article 29 of National Security Law uh, if, he, if it helps the US government to impose sanctions. Uh, the second thing is about the foreign students. Yeah, I, I, first of all, of course, I agree with Harling that, um, well, uh, if he stays away from from those four kinds of activities, then well, he would not be caught in national security law. And um, however, one thing that the extra thing that he should bear in mind in light of the extraterritoriality is that well, um, so of course, if he comes to Hong Kong, he should abide with the law of Hong Kong, no question about it. That would be so regardless of where there's a national security law. But the importance of national security law, as we've mentioned, the extraterritorial reach means that, well, he should be like, if he committed some acts, was even outside Hong Kong, okay, before he comes here, okay, then, well, uh, theoretically, it could be caught under national security law as well. And there's something that might be worth bearing in mind. Thank you. Um, I think there's one quick point. Sorry, Albert. Can I just make one quick point about uh, the point that uh, Professor Zhao and uh, Hualing both mentioned, which is about company. I think Hualing says under Article 29, it is asking a foreign country or a foreign entity to impose sanctions that is criminal. But to carry out the sanction is probably not criminal, if I understand correctly. I think that is the point. But if I look at Article 29, Article 29 says, if you, it is a crime, if you ask a foreign individual or entity to implement uh, sanctions, that would be a crime. But then in the second paragraph, it says that foreign entity, which was asked to implement the sanctions, would actually also be guilty of, of crime. It, it will be treated as both uh, a criminal. So I think the, the legal conundrum or the legal risk is there that a company may find itself to be required by uh, a foreign law to impose certain sanctions, which at the same time violates Hong Kong's own national security. Thank you. Um, so, as promised, uh, I, I just said that uh, a few more questions sent in, uh, you know, in the last uh, 20 minutes will be read out, so I'll do that. Um, so I think there are three or four questions. Will be the, this will be the very last round of questions. Um, sorry. So, um, so there's a question about company. Will an, will an officer of a company be prosecuted as the representative of the company, even though the company uh, is not a natural person and is not subject to that particular uh, provision? So that's one question. Uh, second question, what is considered sanction? For example, the US has forbidden the sale of certain products to China uh, under the export control rules, if a company refuses to sell a product into China, would that be considered sanction? So that's the second question. Uh, third question, uh, is Hong Kong a member of some human rights treaties? And if, if so, um, uh, if somebody is uh, extradited to mainland under this uh, national security law 
Uh, is there anywhere where people can uh, appeal to? Um, next question. Um, can the NPC issue an interpretation of Article 38 so as to make this article mirror the language in Article 8 of the Chinese criminal law? If so, would this help uh, to reduce some of the concerns regarding, uh, artic uh, in regarding Article 38? Um, next question, how do extraterritorial principles apply to laws protecting core interests of states that may not be consistent, consistent with the Johannesburg principle? Uh, what will other states simply refuse to provide judicial assistance or refuse to extradite? And uh, last question, um, is there any substantial restriction which international law would uh, impose on the application of the Hong Kong national security law? So that's uh, the final batch of questions. Uh, uh, may, may I invite any of our four speakers to, to comment or respond to any of those questions? Start first. Ooh. Ooh. Then me, you want to start first? Okay, I'll just pick up uh, just a, a few of them. I'll pick the easy ones first. Uh, <laughs> can the Standing Committee issue an interpretation of Article 38? Of course, they will but uh, can, they, they can, they, they can do that. But will they do that? Probably not. Uh, I don't think they want to, uh, uh, I don't think Article 38 uh, is going to be uh, uh, a source of many cases in any event. Uh, so I, the chances of the Standing Committee picking up uh, Article 38 to do an interpretation, I think is, is not uh, uh, significant at all. Uh, well, uh, in regard to the human rights that's applicable to Hong Kong, if a person is extradited to China, uh, what can be done? Uh, what authorities can you appeal to? Well, obviously, I suppose the only authorities you can appeal to in that circumstance uh, would be uh, the mainland Chinese authorities. Uh, there are procedures uh, out there available under Chinese law. How uh, uh, effective are they is a completely uh, different issue. On the other hand, uh, Hong Kong being a party to the ICCPR, well, I should say China being a party to the ICCPR, uh, which ap applies to Hong Kong only, uh, there is the ICCPR procedure that can uh, be uh, uh, relevant. Uh, uh, no doubt if, uh, uh, if Hong Kong authorities deal with an individual human being in a way that does not uh, conform with the ICCPR requirement, so for instance, if uh, Hong Kong surrenders a person to mainland China under Article 55, uh, and suppose in that case, the person, let's say, is denied the right to counsel, uh, is subject to torture and so on, uh, Hong Kong itself will have to be accountable for a possible breach of ICCPR. Uh, but on the, other, on the other hand, the ICCPR procedure doesn't really have, uh, have a lot of teeth. Uh, the committee may review the situation and may uh, issue criticism, but that's probably uh, it. I'll leave other more difficult questions to my colleagues on the panel. Thank you. Um, who, who would like to comment further? Do you have any answer to it? Okay. All right. Yourself? Uh, um, I think the, on, on the corporate uh, the liability, you know, whether the officer will be, uh, uh, which one will be responsible. I think there is, uh, there's a, a base question, which is uh, what law will be applicable if that happens, right? Uh, so I think we'll have to first decide uh, in determined, in answering the question, should we, uh, looking for answer within the Chinese criminal law, because uh, after all, this is a national law, or should we looking for answer in, in Hong Kong criminal law? Right. But my understanding is that in either circumstances, the answer is yes. Uh, you, uh, there's the, uh, 
the companies, their officers behind will be made uh, responsible. I think I, th I don't think there's any doubt on that uh, question. There's a larger question about China uh, international cooperation extradition. Um, since the anti-corruption um, campaigns, which started six years ago, right, China has been say, mobilizing itself, try to get say the uh, uh, corrupt officials, S uh, SOE bosses, back to China to face criminal trial. I, uh, we heard this, uh, you know, the red alert, 100 officials, by now I think over probably 80 of them uh, have been re sort of returned to, to China to face trial. If you look at that practice, I think the Chinese experience is, is that international cooperation actually is not really useful. Um, the, Either China doesn't have treaties with the major powers, right? Australia, Canada, and the, uh, uh, the major the US, and the most of the European countries. And if even there is a treaty, and the, uh, uh, all the, uh, the countries willing to extradite, the process is just so lengthy, uh, uh, make it probably irrelevant. Um, so what has happened, I think, in the mind of decision makers, Probably, China probably would do well without any international cooperation. If that's the case, so why bother, right? What's the point? If you terminate certain treaties, that's fine. If you don't uh, cooperate, that's fine. There's always, it seems to me, uh, alternative ways to achieve the Chinese agenda. Um, so, so that is not a question we'll have to think about, right? You have to make the, the international platform, the rules, procedures relevant to China. If China feels that they are, they are not really useful, they are not even relevant, then there's a possibility China probably say, well, okay, we'll, we'll just do it our own way. If you look at all the official coming to, to return to China for this trial, uh, probably it's less than 5% return to China through formal uh, uh, legal channels or through uh, international corporations. Most of them are simply done in uh, typical Chinese ways. Okay. Um, do any of the speakers have any further comments before we bring this seminar to a close? Okay, I, uh, Albert, I, I'd oh, like to address... Please, please, yes. Question: Whether international imposes you know, uh, uh, restrictions on the application of uh, the Hong Kong national security law? Uh, of course, you know. Uh, 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 actually, you know, uh, as a matter of fact, you know, international, even though you know, uh, uh, lacks uh, very precise and very detailed uh, rules uh, in terms of uh, the scope and the limits of extraterritorial, you know, uh, 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 application of uh, the law. Uh, but, you know, uh, uh, we said, you know, uh, it's well established that, you know, um, uh, the, uh, 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 the, 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 the sort of, you know, uh, jurisdiction uh, must be exercised uh, in a manner that uh, uh, um, the exercise of uh, prescriptive jurisdiction, uh, uh, when a genuine connection exists between the state seeking to regulate uh, and the person, property, or conduct being regulated. So this uh, 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 genuine connection uh, between uh, 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 the regulating state and you know uh, the person, property, or conduct you know uh, affected uh, is uh, one of you know the uh, 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 Sort of, you know, uh, reasonableness uh, is one one form of reasonableness, and this is a, a, a very important. Uh, also, um, uh, international, you know, uh, prohibits you know uh, any state from you know uh, intervening the internal affairs of other states. So, if you use you know uh, uh, this law as a weapon, you know, uh, for uh, this illegal uh, intervention, uh, international uh, uh, sort of, you know. Uh, 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 
prohibits you to, uh, from doing that. So this is just you know a couple of examples uh, to um, uh, show that you know international does impose restrictions on the application uh, uh, of such law as uh, the Hong Kong national security law. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, actually, we have exceeded our original time uh, by half an hour. So I think we will have to finish. Now, so may I take this opportunity to thank uh, all the participants, uh, including all the participants in this room and online, uh, and also to thank our four speakers for uh, sharing with us their, their, their research and their insight on the extraterritorial aspects uh, of the Hong Kong national security law. Uh, this is not the last uh, of the seminars which we are hosting. Uh, on the uh, national security law, uh, a few more seminars are uh, in the pipeline. So I hope uh, members of the audience will pay attention to our further notices. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again uh, in, in the next seminar. So we'll now uh, say goodbye to all of you. Thank you. <laughs>